All right, everyone. Thanks for coming back from lunch. Uh, my name is Henny Edmoni, and I'd like to start the uh, 15th Spotlight session uh, at RSS. So I'm happy to introduce our first speaker, um, is Sid Reddy, and he's going to be giving a talk titled Shared Autonomy via Deep Reinforcement Learning. Hi, I'm Sid, and today I'll be talking about a deep reinforcement learning algorithm for shared autonomy. Teleoperation is challenging for people because robots tend to have unintuitive dynamics. For instance, here I'm trying to play the lunar lander game and land between the two flags, but I keep crashing and losing control. If the landing spot wasn't obvious, but instead was internal to me and my intent, an assumption that models real systems like driver assist and prosthetic limb control, then landing correctly would also be challenging for an autonomous agent. Human pilots can act on their intent and head toward the intended landing site, but can't stabilize flight. A fully autonomous agent, on the other hand, doesn't know the user's intended landing site, but can easily avoid crashing. The idea behind shared autonomy is to combine user input with automated assistance to achieve the user's intent. Existing shared autonomy frameworks infer user intent and assist by making three fundamental assumptions. First, that intent can be described by a goal, and that a set of candidate goals is known a priori. Second, that given a particular goal, we have a model of how the user will operate to achieve it. And finally, that we know the system's dynamics. But in lots of real-world applications, none of this holds. We don't know how to describe user intent. We don't know how different people will choose to operate the robot. And finally, the physical system may be complex and hard to model. In our work, we try to lift these three assumptions using model-free deep reinforcement learning with the human in the loop. Our first attempt was the sort of obvious thing to do. We fed a neural network the system state and human control as input and had it predict the next action for the agent to take. We trained it using standard policy gradient methods where the reward signal came directly from the user. In theory, this enabled the agent to implicitly decode the user's intent from their control input. However, providing a numerical reward at every single time step is impossible for a human user. And when we simplified the setup to have the user only supply a single reward at the end of each episode to indicate task success or failure, learning became too slow. But the nature of these teleoperation tasks is such that part of the reward is actually known, things like not crashing. So we can pre-train with this dense reward and later fine tune on sparse feedback from the user to personalize the assistance model. We tried this in simulation and it worked really well. But then we tested it with real human pilots and it was a total disaster. The agent's policy, especially during the early stages of training, would take the user's input, look at it, and proceed to do something totally different. That meant the users weren't getting any feedback on their control input, but that's exactly what people need in order to correct their input over time. So their input ended up becoming more and more uninformative over time. So what we did was, Rather than executing the agent's control policy directly, we had the agent try to match the user as closely as possible while still executing high-value actions. To do this, we used Q-learning, which gives us values of actions and is an off-policy algorithm, which means the agent can learn even when we deviate from its policy to give the human some comfort. So now, in addition to giving the users feedback on their input, this approach also allows the human robot team to perform at the level of the human during the early stages of training, as opposed to initially performing like a random policy. In our first user study, we had 12 participants play the lunar lander game on their own and with the assistance of our method. We found that assistance helped users succeed significantly more often and crash less often than they would on their own. So human, robots te human robot teams succeeded more and crashed less than individual humans, they also succeeded more than fully autonomous agents, although that did come at the cost of crashing more often than the autonomous agent. To test our method on a real robot, we had four participants attempt to land a quad rotor on a small landing pad while simultaneously orienting an onboard camera to point at a target object in the environment. The assistive agent knew the location of the landing pad, but didn't know which object the user wanted to look at. We found that assisted users were able to successfully orient and land while unassisted users were able to orient correctly, but rarely landed on the pad. Here's an illustration of some pads that users took without and with assistance. Red pads ended in a crash, while green ended in success. We found that assisted users succeeded significantly more often and crashed less often than unassisted users. 
And finally, I'd like to note that our method is capable of leveraging a goal space and user model when they are known, while still keeping the dynamics unknown. To conclude, the key insight in our work is that when we are careful about designing the reward function and integrating user control into the final action, we can use model-free deep RL to implement shared autonomy with minimal assumptions. Thank you. Our next speaker is Moet Sridhar, uh, and he'll be presenting a talk titled Interactive Visual Grounding of Referring Expressions for Human-Robot Interaction. Hi everyone, my name is Mohit and I'm from NUS. My talk is about talking to robots. So in the future, we'll be living with autonomous butlers who'll take care of our everyday needs like cooking and cleaning. So imagine if you could say, hey robot, stack the cups and put them in the shelf. Or hey robot, make me a fruit salad. Natural language provides a very powerful interface for humans to communicate with robots while also allowing robots to communicate back with humans. In this work, we take a look at a small subset of this natural language problem, which is to do with grounding referring expressions or locating objects from visual descriptions. And specifically, we take a look at three aspects of this problem. Firstly, how do we understand expressions like the blue soda can without explicitly defining object categories like apple, banana, or can? Also, how do we understand relationships like the blue can in the middle without explicitly defining templates like in the middle, on the left, on the right? And finally, in the case of ambiguity, we want the robot to ask uh, smart questions, like, do you mean this blue can in the middle? And this allows us to solicit additional information from the user. To this end, we propose a unified framework called grounding by generation, which is broadly influenced by analysis by synthesis and cognitive science. Typically, visual grounding involves taking an image and an expression as input and outputting the location of the desired object. Visual generation involves taking an image and describing every object in the scene using visual attributes like color, shape, size, or spatial relationships. In our framework, we initially generate a set of descriptions for every object in the scene. And once the user provides an input, like find me the red can, we ground by finding the closest match to one of the generated expressions. In the case that the expression is ambiguous, we can use the same generated expression to ask a question, like, do you mean this left can? And this allows us to solicit additional information uh, and communicate what the robot understands about the world. In implementation, uh, this model is separated into two stages. In the first stage, we use a CNN LSTM architecture to generate a set of word probabilities representing a sentence for each object. And this is essentially a standard image captioning model from computer vision. Once the user provides an input, like uh, pick up the red can next to the teddy bear, we ground by clustering objects, which generated very similar expressions, to the input expression. In the second stage, we examine all pairwise relationships of the chosen candidate objects. And again, using the grounding by generation principle, we, ground, uh, we generate a set of descriptions for each pair, which describe the spatial relationship for, for each pair. And then we ground by clustering pairs, which generated very similar expressions to the input expression. Uh, if we can choose a single pair with confidence, then our job is done. Otherwise, we use one of the generated expressions from the first stage or the second stage to ask questions. So we integrated this model with a Kinova Miko arm and an Amazon Echo Dot, and you're about to see a representative sample of the results. Uh, note that the, all the objects you're about to see are part of the test set, uh, which weren't seen during training. Pick up the tennis ball doesn't get confused with the other two balls. Pick up the middle blue cup. Put it in the blue cup on the left. Pick up the left blue cups. Put it in the green cup on the far right. Pick up the water bottle. It's ambiguous. Do you mean this water bottle on the right? No, the water bottle on the left. Pick up the stuffed animal. Do you mean this teddy bear on the desk? 
No. Do you mean this stuffed animal with a black and yellow face? Go ahead. Pick up the apple. Do you mean this apple on the bottom right? No. The apple on the top left. Pick up the soda can. Put it in my left hand. So it also understands a bit about perspectives, like my left, my right. More details on this in the paper. We conducted a couple of user studies to evaluate our setup, and we found that our system is more accurate than a state-of-the-art baseline, and we're also faster in terms of disambiguation. I'd be happy to talk more in the post session. Thank you. Our third speaker is Valtz Blukas. Uh, he'll be presenting a talk titled Following High-Level Navigation Instructions on a Simulated Quadcopter with Imitation Learning. Hello, everyone. My name is Valtz Blukas, and this is joint work with Natalie Brookheim, Andrew Bennett, Ross Snepper, and Joao Vartzi. We're solving the problem of following high-level navigation instructions on a simulated quadcopter with imitation learning. Consider this quadcopter executing a synthetic language instruction. To complete the task, it has to understand the instruction, recognize the objects, ground the instruction to a goal location, and fly there while continuously adjusting its heading. This requires spatial reasoning abilities and memory. In this work, we build an end-to-end -end neural network system that explicitly solves these challenges. Our model takes as input first-person camera images and pose estimates and produces low-level velocity commands. Roboticists have been building functional systems to reason spatially for years by building maps. Maps allow reasoning in a static reference frame and avoid dealing with constantly changing first-person observations. Meanwhile, most neural network systems for visual motor and instruction-following tasks operate on first-person images. As a result, neural network layers have to learn how to map from first-person view to some static reference frame if they are to build a world model. This is challenging because it requires learning coordinate transformations and memory operations which are actually things that we know how to design. So in this work, we take the approach of manually engineering those parts of the system that we know how to design while using machine learning for the things that are hard. Following this idea, we embed a mapping system within the neural network architecture. This allows us to build an environment map. Um, sorry. Yeah, basically the model consists of five stages. Feature extraction, camera projection, mapping, grounding, and control. And it allows us to reason in the static map without worrying about the constantly changing first-person observations. So in the first step, we extract feature map from the input image using a residual neural network. This gives us a feature map that um, encodes information about various image regions. This feature map is observed from a different viewpoint at every time step. Instead, we would like to have a representation that is consistent through time. For this reason, we project this map using a pinhole camera model such that representation of a static object is always projected to the same location regardless how the direction of view changes. We use this representation to build a semantic map of the environment. The way this works is we observe an image, we extract the projected features, and we add these to the map. We remember the map for future time steps, and we repeat this through time. Over time, we obtain a more and more informative map that stores information about everything that we've seen so far. Now that we have this semantic map, we can move on to instruction understanding. To ground the instruction in the map, we apply two convolutional filters where the kernels have been computed from the instruction at test time. The first filter outputs a grounding map that highlights every object that was mentioned in the instruction. The second filter outputs a goal map. It learns to resolve spatial relations such as left off or in front to predict the navigation goal location. During training, we use various auxiliary objectives to ensure that these maps actually, actually capture object groundings and the goal location prediction. Finally, we use a multi-layer perceptron to output the velocity command that we send directly to the drone flight controller. This velocity command consists of forward linear velocity and an angular yaw rate. We train our model using imitation learning, specifically a variant of the dagger algorithm that trades convergence guarantees for speed and memory efficiency. The model is trained end-to-end -end by Im imitating an oracle policy that has access to ground truth trajectories, while our model only sees images and instructions. 
To evaluate our model, we generate 3,500 synthetic in instructions, each in a random environment. We collect 3,500 Oracle rollouts and only 2,000 policy rollouts, which is a fairly small number for learning 252 different possible tasks. We find that the mapping and projection operations are what allow our model to outperform conventional neural network architectures while almost reaching the Oracle performance. In this example, our model is executing the instruction go to the left side of the plane. The model has learned to distinguish the various objects in the semantic map. It has then recognized the airplane in the grounding map while ignoring all other objects. Finally, in the goal map, the model has resolved the spatial relation the left side to the left side of the plane. Then the model executes, bringing the quadcopter to a stop at the correct goal position. Notice that the quadcopter stops precisely even after the airplane has exited its field of view. This is possible because they're reasoning on the map and not on the first person observations. Thank you. We'll be happy to provide more details at the post session. Our final talk in this session um, will be given by two speakers, uh, Tian He Yu and Chelsea Finn. And their talk is titled One Shot Imitation from Observing Humans via Domain Adaptive Meta Learning. Hi everyone, we'll be presenting our work on domain adaptive meta-learning for imitation of human videos. Humans are remarkably good at imitating others just by watching them. Robots, on the other hand, require much more direct means of supervision, such as kinesthetic teaching, teleoperation, and putting sensors on humans. In this work, we aim to answer the question, can we use a video of a human to indicate the goal of a task? If we could do so, it would be significantly easier for the average human to just show robots what they want them to do. <coughs> but to do so, we need a correspondence between the humans and the robots. How might we get a, go about getting this mapping? Unfortunately, it's extremely challenging to engineer this correspondence between humans and robots. It's not enough to simply track the human's motion and remap it onto the robot. Instead, the interaction depends much more crucially on interactions with objects. What if we instead provided robots with examples and let the robot figure out for itself how to imitate humans? In particular, what if we developed an algorithm that could enable robots to learn how to learn from third-person videos of humans? That's exactly what we'll do. Essentially, what we'll aim to learn is a translation from videos of humans to a policy of the robot performing the task that the human was showing. And we'll do this over a number of different meta-training tasks, collecting data of videos, videos of, of humans, and demonstrations from robots. Then at test time, we provide a video of a human doing a task with a new object, and the robot needs to learn a policy for that task. Next, Kevin will talk about the details of our approach. OK. We build upon model agnostic meta learning a memo, which optimizes for a set of parameters such that after a small number of grid descent, the model can generalize to new examples. Essentially, MAMO trains for transferability to many different tasks with a small amount of data. In our work, we aim to train a neural network parameterized by theta and mapping from images to robot actions such that running grid descent with respect to human videos can lead to effective performance on a task with respect to robot demonstrations. The loss function here is a simple behavior cloning loss. At test time, we will just run grid descent with respect to a human video from a new task. Unfortunately, the behavior cloning loss cannot be evaluated with a human video. The key insight of our paper is that we can learn this loss function. So we will both learn a loss function and a set of initial parameters such that after watching a human demonstration, the robot can perform this task very well. Next, we will show some experimental results. Uh, we train our model with a PR2 robot and with a diverse range of objects and physics. For all experiments, Different tasks correspond to different objects, and different demonstrations within a task correspond to different positions of objects. We test our model with all held out novel objects a robot has never seen during training. We collect our robot demonstrations via teleoperation, as you can see in the video here. So first, we show a placing experiment, where a robot needs to place a holding object into a target container amid two distractors. We show a human demonstration on the left, Know that all objects are never seen by the robot before. Then we shuffle objects on the table, 
and the robot can successfully place a peach into a red bowl. We shuffle objects again, and the robot can still complete that task quite well. Okay, next, we show a push experiment where a robot needs to push an object to a left gripper amid one destructor. So again, on the left, we show a human demonstration. Then we shuffle the two objects on the table, and the robot can successfully locate the correct object and push that to the left. Finally, we show a pick and place experiment where a robot needs to grasp the object and place that into a target container amid two distractors. On the left, a human is grasping this toy and placing that into the blue bowl. We shuffle the three containers on the table, and the robot this time can actually put, pick up that toy and slowly drop that into the blue container. So now we'll show some experiments with larger domain shift. By large domain shift, we mean different backgrounds and different camera angles. On the left, we show videos of a human pushing objects to the left in a yellow background. So our model can handle this large domain shift quite well, as you can see in the videos on the right. Okay, so here are our takeaways. We list our collaborators here. The code and the video of our paper are also available online. Please come to our post session for more details. Thank you. All right, we're gonna invite all the speakers back onto stage for the Q&A, and in the meantime, I'd like to invite all of the speakers for the next session to go up and get mic'd on this side room. Do we have questions for our speakers? There's one in the back there. This is the blue microphone, please. Hi, uh, this is for the last talk. So demonstrations are inherently ambiguous and underspecified. So from a single demonstration, you know, you can't really tell if the you know, object was supposed to touch the gripper or be at that exact place on the table or be you know, five inches to the left of some other object. So uh, how would you say that the, you know, from the meta-learning procedure, the, the system is dealing with this and, and what assumptions are being made? So that's a good question. Uh, and actually, in the paper, we've shown experiments. Uh, in, in prior work, we've shown experiments where if you give it more than a single demonstration, it's able to actually do better because it reduces some of the ambiguity uh, that sometimes occurs in different demonstrations. In these particular experiments, we constrain the type of setup to be a particular set of tasks. So it's able to infer uh, within the set of tasks, within the distribution that was trained on, what task it should perform. Other questions? Blue microphone again. Hi. Hello? Hello? Yeah. This is for the first speaker. Um, I was curious if you noticed a learning effect as people got used to either the shared autonomy or the sort of teleoperation thing. Like, I know that sort of people can learn to perform Lunar Lander better over time, and I was wondering if the, the shared setup one, um, improve their uh, ability sort of faster, or if they could sort of learn on the shared and, and perform the teleoperation better? So I don't have a good answer to that question because we actually tried to control for the learning effect so that we could isolate the effect of providing assistance versus just having them play on their own. So what we did was we actually counterbalanced the order of the two uh, conditions for each uh, participant. And we also had them just play as many episodes as they wanted before the entire experiment so that they got used to the controls. But um, I'm optimistic about this idea that maybe in a shared autonomy setting, you could actually learn faster to control a system uh, in addition to just performing better in absolute terms. Green microphone. Hi, for, for the second speaker, uh, 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 I, I would like to understand how uh, is there a hypothesis on the fact that the human and the robot see the same thing with the, just for the, with the, the term? That's right. Uh, we assume the image given to the system is what the user sees. Anything outside the image, we, we don't know about it. But actually, if you want to include the whole scene, you could just have multiple images, and you could do the same thing, or like you do like some image stitching, or you just run the whole thing with all the images. 
Yeah, but then the far right will not be... It won't be far right, but in the paper we talk about uh, perspective correction. So what we do is we can uh, make the image, uh, we can reproject the image so that it looks exactly like what it would look for the person. But obviously there's a problem with like occlusion and everything, yeah. but it's definitely possible. Yes. Blue microphone. Hey, I have a question for the third speaker. So for the quarter, you are giving commands based on text, but sometimes that is ambiguous. And if it's, if it's possible that there are two objects and you're like trying to go to the, which are the same, and you're saying like go to the left of this object, like how will your algorithm work? And the second question is why is it so difficult to just point on a map? Like why do we need it to be based on text and not just select a point on the map? Okay, so for the que first question was, um, how do we deal with ambiguous instructions? So basically in the training set, we did have a bunch of examples where we had multiple trees, and the instruction would be go to the left side of the tree. In this case, we didn't actually consider this uh, scenario in the training setup, so it would usually just go to either one of the trees, or sometimes it would end up going somewhere in the middle. So that is uh, something that we should address in future work. Um, it's a very real problem in dealing with real natural language instructions. Um, sorry, what was the quest second question? About? If you, uh, so if you have a map of the environment. Oh, right, yeah, why do you not just point to the map and why do you use? So basically this is part of a larger body of work on um, the, we're trying to get to handle more and more complex, more and more natural instructions and trying to deal with the spatial reasoning that, that arises. So the end goal is really to follow the instruction as specified by the user. Um, yeah. But the, we focus on specifically the spatial reasoning. Still the blue microphone. Uh, I, I have a question for last speakers. Um, what are the failure cases in your experiments and what are the limitations in your methods in general? So sometimes the uh, object cannot be located very accurately, so you may just misplace it. And sometimes you can still overfit to some cases because the data may be not efficient, uh, sufficient enough. So it may just go, just imitate what it does in the demonstration rather than actually finding out what the correct object is. So I think the data efficiency is a very big limitation in our work, so maybe we can improve that in the future work. Another thing that we really want to uh, build upon in this work is that so far we've mostly considered the setting where different tasks correspond to different objects. And this allows us a test time to be able to adapt and interact with novel objects. Uh, but in future work, we'd like to look at the setting where different tasks correspond to entirely different motions, such that we can get much stronger generalization at test time and be able to learn uh, entirely different skills uh, from a few demonstrations. All right, and with that, let's thank all of our speakers again one more time.